Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a, a right way and a wrong way to be the people of God. There is, a, um, there is a way in which we clearly live out and proclaim God and His kingdom, and there is a, a fuzzy way in which we live out and proclaim God and His kingdom. There is, there is a way in which we can journey with Christ that is right and a way that we can journey with Christ that is not right. I'm not always sure that we think of our, our walk with Christ in that way. I think sometimes in our minds, that our, our mindset is we are just journeying with Christ. And, and way, way deep back in our minds or something in us that says, and Christ is awfully lucky to have us. Right? But I'm convinced as I read the scriptures more and more that God, if we're not, if we're not sensitive to the right and the wrong way to be the people of God and to follow and to journey, God is. And if it, even if it's not all that important to us sometimes, it is important to Him. And I think there is something of that idea that's, that's wrapped up in, in this story from Numbers chapter 20. Now, the, the writer sets the stage for us at the very beginning. More than likely, the story takes place um, almost getting close to 40 years after they have come out of Egypt. And if you've read any of Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers, you know that the people of Israel have given Moses and God a difficult time. And, and at the beginning of this, we find something happening in Moses' life that is particularly stressful. His sister, Miriam, dies. And I don't care what age you are or, or how your family is arranged. It's difficult. I'm, I'm sure it's difficult to deal with the death of a sibling. And I am convinced that Moses is grieving deeply for his sister. They have worked together, Moses and Aaron, his brother, and Miriam, his sister. They have been the three leaders of Israel. They have worked together. Miriam has been a prophetess. Miriam has been a poetess. They have worked together in leading the people. And now she is dead. And, and Moses is grieving that. And in the middle of that grief, the people come to him complaining once again. We don't have any water. We don't have any water. And Moses, it's your fault. If only we were back in Egypt. Because back in Egypt, they have, there's all kinds of, of great fruits and vegetables and, and all kinds of things for us to experience. And there's plenty of water. And you've let us out here in the desert. What are you going to do about it, Moses? And I can see them sort of standing here going, so show us. And Moses' response is perfect. It's exactly what we're supposed to do in those moments. When we're feeling grief, and we're feeling attacked, and we're feeling mistreated, and we're feeling that everything is against us. And that no matter what we do right, it goes, people look at it wrong. You know, it's that no good deed goes unpunished. What does Moses do? He turns to God. He and Aaron head to the tabernacle, and they fall down on their faces before God, and they say, Lord, what do we do? We need your help. That's exactly what we're supposed to do in those moments, to come before God and to say, God, what do we do? It's exactly right. And God speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, here's what you do. Three things. Take your staff, 
probably the staff that Moses used that he held out over the Red Sea when the waters parted. Take your staff, assemble all the people around the big rock, and speak to the rock. And so Moses gets up, dusts himself off, heads out. He does exactly what God says. He takes his staff, he assembles the people, and then things turn. And instead of speaking to the rock, Moses speaks to the people. And he begins to berate them. And he says to them, you rebels. You rebels. What is wrong with you? Are we going to have to do miracle after miracle after miracle for you, for you see what the truth is? You people, I mean, he doesn't say this, but I can hear him in the back of my mind. This is maybe what I would say. You people make me sick. You're driving me crazy. We have to do another thing for you? And then Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, he takes his staff and he strikes it two times. I don't think Moses tapped the rock. I think he picked up that staff and he held it as far as he could in his hand and he slammed it down onto that rock twice. Moses is angry. He's angry at these people. It's, it's sort of like he's reached the end of his rope. And you know, anger is not necessarily always a problem. God gets angry. The prophets get angry. When Moses comes down from the, from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and he sees the people worshiping the golden calf, he gets angry and God doesn't seem to be bothered by that. Jesus gets angry a few times. Paul gets angry. Anger in and of itself is not necessarily wrong. But it seems to me that the difference between anger that is right, God's anger, and anger that's wrong, which tends to be our anger, is the direction of it and the reason for it. God's anger tends to be because of injustice. God's anger tends to be about sin. Our anger tends to be we're embarrassed, we're hurt, somebody mistreated us, something didn't go the way we wanted it to. The difference is our anger tends to be self-centered. It's about self-interest. And, and here, that seems to be the anger of Moses. Because Moses is not kind to the people. It's not just about sin. It's about he's, he's berating the people for his ang- in his anger. But I'm also convinced that Moses is angry with God. Something strange happens here. It just struck me recently. Moses doesn't seem angry with God when he goes in to pray, but he does seem angry with God when he gets done praying. You'd think it'd be the other way around, right? I'm all upset and angry. I spend time with God, and I'm able to relax. But Moses... When, when the people are, are attacking him, he runs to God, and, he, and he, he falls before God and says, what do I do? Help me. But when he comes out, he seems to be angry. And I, I think it's because God doesn't do what Moses wants him to do. I think Moses is looking for God to vindicate him. I think Moses is looking for God to say, you know, you're exactly right. Stand back. Let me wipe out a few of these people to teach them a lesson. They can't talk to you like that. Right? I mean, let's put ourselves in Moses' shoes. When we people are mistreating us, when people are when we feel like we have been the brunt of something unfair, what do we want done? We want to be vindicated. And nothing's better than having God Almighty vindicate us. But he doesn't. And Moses is wrestling with that. And I think Moses inherently is saying, God. Why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Why aren't you doing what you should do? Why aren't you following what I want you to do? And when I think about that, when I think about Moses' response, the the road sign that comes to my mind is speed limit. It's a speed limit sign. 
Now, I, I'm very impatient with speed limit signs. I don't know about you. Maybe you love them. Maybe you like slowing down, going through all these little cities and villages in western New York. I do not like that. You know, it seems to me like most of them are at the bottom of a hill, too. So the whole time you're driving into the town, you're riding, you can feel your brakes disintegrating as you're going into the town, right? And, and, and I'm always, I always wait to the very last minute to slow down. You know, if, if the 30 minute sign, 30 mile per hour sign's right there, then I'll start slowing down to right there. Because I got places to be, I got people to see, I have things I want to do. It's, I, I don't want to slow down. But I'm convinced that there is something about the kingdom of God that calls us to slow down. Now, sometimes in the kingdom, speed matters. When the Israelites are preparing to leave Egypt, God says to them through Moses, now look, you're going to make this meal, and you need to bake it in haste, and you need to eat it in haste. In fact, they are, to, they are asked to eat with their coats on, their shoes on, and everything ready to go with their suitcases right next to them because you're going to go. There is a level of haste and, and speed when Paul writes to, second, writes to Corinth, the Corinthians in his second letter and he says, now is the time of salvation. Today is the time we need to think about Jesus. There is, there is speed involved in that. But when I read the scriptures, those probably are exceptions to the rule. Because when you read the life of Jesus, what do you find? You find Jesus moving slowly. Jesus never seems to be in a hurry. You think about the story of Lazarus. And he, he hears Lazarus is dying. He waits four days. And when he gets there, what do Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, say to him? They say, if only you had been here. In other words, if only you had been faster. There's a story of a man who comes to Jesus and says, my my child is dying. Will you come heal her? And Jesus says, sure. And they start making their way. And then a woman who, who has been struggling with illness for almost 20 years touches Jesus' robe and she's healed. And Jesus stops and he wants to know who touched him. And he has this lengthy conversation with this woman. And by the time they get to, this, to the child, the child has died. And everybody says, Jesus, if you've just been faster. And yet, with both Lazarus and the child, Jesus does an even greater miracle. Jesus never seems to be in a hurry. I think if we were planning the strategy of, of the Messiah coming to earth, we wouldn't have waited 30 years, first of all, for him to, to emerge on the scene. And we certainly would have made his activity a lot busier. Because that's how we operate. That's what we value. And I think that's because we think that our, our most important priority is what we accomplish for God. But God keeps telling us our most important priority is developing relationship with God. What we accomplish comes out of the relationship. But often we bypass the relationship because it's too slow. It takes too much time. It takes too much investment. We just want to do great things for God. The problem is, when all our focus is on accomplishing things for God, who gets the glory? We do. Back in our minds is the mindset that says, look at what I can do for God. And other people are saying, wow, look at what you can do for God. I think they're saying to Moses, look at what Moses can do for God. Or look at what Moses can do. I think that's why God is so harsh with Moses. I mean, I have to admit, I'm going to cut Moses some slack here because after you've been listening to hundreds of thousands of people whine and complain for 40 years, I think I'd blow my top sometimes as well. Right? I mean, I certainly can commiserate with Moses, and you probably can too. Enough is enough. God doesn't seem to see it that way because in verse 12... God says to him, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I'm giving them. 
So what Moses has set out to do, God says, that's not going to happen because you got ahead of me. I'm convinced God was going to honor Moses. He was going to give honor to Moses as the leader. He already had been doing that. But Moses couldn't wait. And Moses ran ahead of God. And it cost him a level of joy. God doesn't reject him. But he misses out on something glorious that he was hoping to experience. And sometimes we miss the joy in the journey with God. We will miss joy in the journey with God if we are continually thinking about speed and pace and accomplishments instead of relationship first. You have to understand, by the time this story takes place, most of the people who were, who were adults when they left Egypt have died. And this is a new generation of Israelites. And they need to know who God is. They need to know the nature and the character of God. And it's Moses' task to show them that and to teach them that and to reveal that to them. And instead, Moses turns their attention to him instead of to God. Moses needs to be reminded that the joy of his journey and the joy of their journey is going to be focused and centered in relationship with God. And when we come to the New Testament, that's exactly what Jesus is doing, and that's what eventually the disciples are able to do. And what I hear the New Testament telling us along these lines is that the joy of the journey with Jesus means we're traveling at the speed of Jesus. That's hard. Because God's speed, the speed of Jesus, isn't always what we think it should be. And it's calling us again to trust him. And sometimes it's hard to trust him. I don't know, it's probably been 15 or so years ago. Our family was coming back from vacation in North Carolina. And we were going through West Virginia. We were on uh, Highway 19, and we came to this town of Summersville, West Virginia. Some of you, if you've traveled that way, you've been through there. And it's a nice little town. We've stopped there. It's kind of halfway. We'd stopped there different times. And as we were coming into town, I wasn't paying attention to the speed limit sign. And so a, a, a person who was employed by the city uh, reminded me of it with flashing lights and things. So I got pulled over. And uh, I have to tell you, I was really mad. I was angry because I thought, I, don't, I didn't see the sign. I was angry because, you know, I was embarrassed to, you know, to be pulled over. I, I was angry because, you know, it was going to cost money to pay this ticket. It was just, it was just not good. And, and I was frustrated by that, and I, I, I made a vow at that point with my family. We're never stopping here in this town again for the rest of our lives. We haven't because we haven't ever gone that way again, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> a year or two later, I was, uh, I was uh, actually in Boston doing my D-men, and I was sitting in the hotel lobby reading USA Today, and there was an article in the paper about uh, famous speed traps in America, and one of the speed traps was in Somersville, West Virginia. And my thought was, ha-ha, I knew it, you know? They just want my money. That's the only reason they're doing this. They just want my money. And I'm reading this article, and and they had an interview with the police chief at that point, and he said this. He said, the reason we do this is not for the money. It's because we had so many fatalities, we had to do something. And when I read that, my whole mindset changed. Everything about my experience changed. Because I saw the purpose, I saw the reason, I saw beyond my own loss and my own stuff. And I realized that this is bigger than me. And maybe what I needed to do instead of blame them, I needed to trust them. That they really were looking out for the best interests of people. And that's where we have to come to with God. Somewhere we have to come to realize that God is right And everything God does is for our good and the good of others. And when God puts speed limit signs in front of us, it's not to hinder us, it's to help us. It's to bring joy to us and and to be catalysts and channels of joy to others, to be image bearers of his grace. 
And Moses has to learn this tough lesson so that the people will learn that tough lesson. And God doesn't budge on this with Moses. There are numerous times after this that Moses comes to God and says, you think you'd change your mind about that? God says no. And counterintuitively what we find is that there is a way in which God is actually harsher on his people, on his image bearers, than he is on people who aren't his people. We tend to get it the other way around. We tend to proclaim it the other way around. That God's demands are so much more on people who aren't following him, but the scripture puts a lot more demands on the people who are following him. Because we are called to be image bearers of his grace. And the only way to be an image bearer of God's grace is to travel at the speed of Jesus. Because if we're not traveling at the speed of Jesus, we're going by so fast, nobody can see Jesus. Nobody can hear Jesus. Nobody will grasp Jesus. We have to commit ourselves to to be sensitive to the speed signs that God puts into our paths. And instead of thinking about accomplishments, we think about relationship. One of the fascinating things to me about this is that despite what Moses does, God still brings water from the rock. I would have thought if it were me, if I were God, now there's a scary thought, but if I were God... When Moses hit that rock, nothing would have happened. And I would have said, Moses, what did I tell you? This is not the way it's going to happen. Right? But that's not God's way. God knows his people need water. And in spite of Moses, they need water. And so he gives them water. Because God is all about grace. And God is continually giving grace and supplying needs. And the point is, we don't, it's not about our accomplishments. It's about what God can do. He just invites us to be a part of what he's doing. But the only way to be a part of what he's doing is to travel at his speed. And to listen to his voice. To think about his voice. To be sensitive and thoughtful about him. His voice. I think that's just what we find in Matthew 9. In this passage, it tells us that Jesus looks on the crowd and he sees that they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And what fascinates me is that the disciples are looking at the exact same people and they don't see it at all. But Jesus does. And because of what Jesus sees, his heart is filled with compassion. His whole being is, is torn up wanting to help them. And then he says to the disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the fields. And I've always wondered about why Jesus says that. It seems an odd thing for him to ask us to pray. And it makes me wonder if what Jesus isn't saying is, pray for God to be able to find people and make people who will go into the harvest at his speed, not at their speed. Because unless we're traveling at the speed of Jesus, we won't see people out there. What happens when the Holy Spirit fills the disciples is that they begin to slow down and people are no longer objects. They are now human beings who have pain and need Jesus. And when our goal is accomplishments, people are stepping stones, people are problems, people are difficulties, and we don't see them at all. But when we travel at the speed of Jesus, our hearts are transformed by Jesus. And people become folks to love through Jesus. And in that, we find the deepest joy of our journey with Jesus. We find joy in that journey of bearing his image in this needy world. Samuel Bringle was a graduate of DePaul University in the 1880s. He went from there to Boston University to earn a theology degree at a time when very few ministers had had those kinds of 
theology degrees. While he was there, he, he had an experience with God through, uh, through hearing uh, William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation When he graduated from Boston University with his master's degree, he felt a call to join the Salvation Army, and so he went to England. He went to England expecting to be able to use his gifts. He was a tremendous orator. He had a great theological mind, and he expected the Salvation Army to use him in that way. When he got there, William Booth said, let's see what this guy is made of. And so instead of sending him out to preach, he had him sitting in a dark basement, half filled with water, polishing the boots of all the other people in the Salvation Army. People who, who didn't have degrees, people who, who were uneducated, people who butchered the king's English, people who didn't have near the theological mind or skills that Bringle did. And as he sat there polishing these boots in this dark, damp basement, he said this, the evil one came to him and he said, Bringle, if I've ever seen a fool, I'm looking at one now. Do you think, do you think this is really the best way to use your gifts and abilities? And he said this, this sense, really, this presence of hell, he said, came over me. And then he heard a second voice. He said, Samuel, he said, I, he said, I, I wash their feet. You're not too good to shine their boots, are you? And he said, in that moment, he made a decision to surrender his way to God's way. And he said, of all the experiences in my life, I think that moment I was as close to heaven as any other time. And out of that experience, the doors began to open for him to speak and to preach and to share his gifts. But he had to slow down to the speed of Jesus. I don't know what kind of speed limit signs God may be putting in front of you. But the joy in the journey is paying attention, listening, surrendering, and to living our journey at the speed of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Give us a want to, a desire to surrender to your way. That we might experience joy and we might be channels of joy. By the grace of Christ, amen.